Well, we'll start with um, Reverend Bill Sma. A uh, question we have is, um, you know, your church really does have, by God's grace, a, a great reputation at uh, connecting with young people, uh, raising up the next generation of church pastors. What are some of the things, and th for, for, for those in the audience who are wondering what, what efforts they can employ in their churches, what are some things you're doing there at your church? Um, so whenever, I think whenever, this is going to be completely unhelpful, um, <laughs> whenever the spirit's moving and, and you see things, you're, you're never in control of it. And you never know quite why it's happening. Um, when the Lord's doing work, you say, thank you, Lord, and you press on. Uh, a few great gifts that have been given. We have been blessed um, just with some tremendous, tremendous uh, volunteers who love the Lord, uh, love the young people in our church, and they pour out hours of their time and prayers uh, working with the young people. And uh, once you begin to build a bit of a vibe, it gets contagious. So our, 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 our church, I don't know how many young people we have, but we'll, we'll have events that will bring over 100 young people from ages 16 to 21 on a night. And they're not all ours. They just kind of come out because they hear stuff's going on. And that's just, yeah, I don't know. Once you get a bit of a good vibe going, the young people get excited and they come out. But it's also our area. Uh, Southern Ontario has a really fantastic um, so I'm from Canada, so I know there's a lot of Canadians here. I speak both American and Canadian, so please don't worry. I will translate on the fly, all right? Uh, but Southern Ontario has a, a real strong um, youth vibe, and our churches are fairly close together. You have to be able to do things together. A lot of it is spiritual and strong. Um, we've had times where you see among the young people... Um, a little less spirituality, a little, a little bit of they're coming to church because their parents make them. And by God's grace right now and over the last number of years, that hasn't been the case. They've been coming to church because they are loving the Lord and they want to live for the Lord. And that's just really helped to stoke and strengthen others in living for Christ. And the young people challenge each other. Mm -hmm. The young people hold each other accountable. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, it's, it's not, again, when you see the Lord working, it's not the work of man. It's God doing neat things through his people by his grace, and, and we've been able to enjoy some of that lately. Wonderful, Greg. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, you know, uh, one thing that um, I think a lot of people in churches want to be better at showing hospitality. And um, Alan, I wonder if, what would you say to someone who says, maybe they're, maybe they're not against showing hospitality, but they may say things like, this is not my gift, or it's not an area that I really excel in, and boy, aren't there other people in the church who can do that sort of thing? I think in your talk you mentioned um, the neighbor, the neighbors witnessing your life, right, and witnessing your your walk, and then saying, wow, they're, 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 what is there? What is that there? Instead of just, what's your problem, right? Um, so you do have to um, be involved in your neighborhood and in your communities, and so what would you say to someone who says, hospitality Sounds great. Someone else will do it. Well, I think you've gotten at it pretty well uh, in the setup, which is to say I think it should be seen as a kind of natural outflow of a vibrant Christian life. Um, and I, I think that, uh, you know, if we're, if we're concerned about our neighbors and the nations, um, you can think of... Uh, you can think of fellowship is particularly that, that koinonia is within the body and that outreach is a, a love of, of strangers. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have this, if we have a passion and desire, as Dr. Kim was saying, for the nations, for all, and uh, of course it's interesting, the American scene right now is very much we're a highly variegated nation. We're a very heterogeneous nation. I mean, the nations are right here. I think the people groups. Uh, Brother Paul's in New York City, and <laughs> you got the nations right there. We're Chicago uh, area. The nations are right here. So, I mean, I think there's plenty of opportunity. Part of what we have to do, we, we want to make people welcome who come into our church. Mm -hmm. um, we want them to be very welcome when they come in the door, and it's Hey, come on in. Welcome. Not, you know, I've been in churches. I've been in churches as the guest pastor um, where, uh, you know, people, when I first came to Mid-America, 
people didn't know me. I mean, I, I'm pretty much known in the Reformed churches now, but I've been in churches where, and the greeter's like, oh, what brings you here this morning? What brings me here? It's Sunday, and this is a church, and I come to worship the Lord. It's not, it, and the, the, the tacit thing was like, who are you related to here? You're obviously not a regular here. So why are you here? I've always liked the question. Are you visiting? Like, no, yeah. I've been a member for six yeah. months. Yeah, right. You've just you've missed me. <laughs> so I mean, part of that love of strangers yeah. is just a, 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 a due outreach to anybody you see, and we're we're eager to tell the gospel again. If we're not, if the gospel isn't coursing through our own veins, and we recognize, as as Peter said, we've been forgiven our past sins, and we recognize how. I mean, if we're kind of tired and sleepy and yeah, I'm a Christian, I've been a Christian forever. I mean, we're not going to share him with, with anybody. And I think the hospitality has to come out of that. Just hospitality on the front end. I mean, who wants to do that? That's too much trouble. But if you're willing to share of your life of yourself, hospitality is just sharing of maybe some food and sharing some, mm -hmm. you know, and I've had people say, well, we live a long ways away. Well, we'll go to some nearer place. There are lots of ways you can do it. It, it may be having people to your house. It may be going to a coffee shop. It's, you know, all of that. But I, I, think, I think it should be a natural adjunct uh, of a vibrant spiritual life and of an outreaching heart and life. Obviously, office bearers, particularly ministers, need to be in somewhat of the exercise of it and need to be, need to be evidencing that. So, um, but I mean, so some people do have it as gifts more than others. I don't doubt that. Mm -hmm. um, but everybody has, there's some minimal um, care and love and, and, and gathering in that you want to show to the stranger. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't want to show to the stranger, like, why don't you go away? You want to, right. why don't you draw near? We love you. Mm -hmm. We want you to know what we know. Mm -hmm. well, the, if I can throw this in, too, I mean, we're, we're not always so good, and part of this is because we're so turned inward, because we're selfish, but... A lot of times we're just not interested in other people. And there really is something about cultivating just an interest in other people. Tell, I don't mean to play off my own stuff. Tell me your story, you know, because it's probably going to be interesting. That, that drives us toward even visitors walking in. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, I would bet that you would, it, Paul, it, we haven't heard from you yet today. Um, many do know you, but um, your ministry in, in New York City, um, what impact has hospitality had there and then, um, what are some of the challenges? Like if, could, you know, if we could go into what are some of the challenges for a confessionally reformed ministry in an urban setting like New York yeah. uh, City? Um, hospitality has played a, a big part in our ministry. When we started, we would just invite everybody back to our church. Um, people at church for the first time, whatever, just come back to our house. And we lived all the way out in Brooklyn. It was no small thing. It wasn't down the block. And then we'd have to figure out how to get people back. But um, people had gotten the hospitality bug, not everybody. But yeah. hospitality played uh, a significant part in my own conversion, if I might. Um, there was a couple, I, I, people had been witnessing to me and word got around about my unbelief, my objections, one thing or the other. There was a couple in Baltimore, Maryland, I was living in New York City, who heard about me and thought that they could um, answer my objections and deal with my problems. And they invited me down to their house to spend the weekend with them. Now, I, I didn't know these people from the hole in the wall. I could have robbed them, killed them, and been back in New York before anybody knew. Um, but what, in, what impressed me was that here were these people that didn't know me, never met me, and were willing to open their home. Mm -hmm. And they spent that weekend hammering me with the gospel, um, literally. We, but all the time they were saying, we think you're a neat guy. And I was like, who are they talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and saying, we want you to become a Christian. Yeah. We, and, and we love you. We want you to become a Christian. And that weekend is what I mark as the beginning of my Christian life. So hospitality means something very important to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a very important aspect. Alan mentioned officers, of course, to qualification for elder. Um, and hospitality, as Alan mentioned, is philoxenia, right? It's love the love the of the stranger. Yeah. It's not just having people over on Sunday. Right. Um, Sunday's not family day, right? It's the Lord's day. 
And our families are deprived if they don't have an opportunity to meet with and welcome people that are visiting church. Mm -hmm. It's a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a young girl uh, converted as a result of attending our church, to be sure, but also being in our home on Lord's Day afternoons and seeing a Christian family, what it was like, because she had no conception of what a normal two-parent, obedient child home looked like. Mm -hmm. And that so impressed her. Uh, that she was converted just seeing the reality that Christ makes in a family. So some of the challenges of, uh, in New York, was it challenges? Yeah, you the ch about? challenges for a confessionally reformed You mentioned church confessionally church. reformed. That's a big challenge. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, to be, to be confessionally reformed church is a steep hill to climb. Mm -hmm. um, we have many distinctives, um, you know, Lord's Day observance, catechism preaching, catechetical instruction, Christian education, these are things, somebody walks in off the street, they never heard of any of those things. Mm -hmm. Now you're talking about that, so that's very hard. I think also, um, we're not a least common denominator uh, church when it comes to what we believe or with respect to worship. So to come into a reformed worship service, dialogical worship, right? Um, is certainly strange, as it should be. We're not coming to a social club. Mm -hmm. But that's very hard for people to get used to. Um, people that have never sung hymns, people that have never sung in church, people that have never been to church. Sure. So you need to be particularly, I think, hospitable and mindful of those kinds of people that come to church. Mm -hmm. And we have been particularly mindful of that in generating a an environment in the church where I like to say this, it admits a qualification, you can beat me up later, but people belong before they believe. Uh, when mm -hmm. people come to church, we're just, we're so glad you're here, you know, we're just so glad you're here. And then talk to them, get to know them, tell us your story, what are you doing, mm -hmm. how did you get to New York, one thing or there. So that's a big challenge, being a confessionally reformed church. The other is just uh, being a commuter church and not having community, and we rent as a number of church planters here find themselves in similar situations. That makes it extremely difficult and extremely dif uh, expensive. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to start, we're trying to start an ESL class now as outreach. We have no place to meet. Um, where we meet for Sunday worship, wanted to charge us $450 a week to meet there. Wow. We pay $50,000 a year rent for four hours on Sunday. Wow. So those are some challenges uh, of being a confessionally reformed church certainly. in New York. Certainly. Yeah. And Paul, if I could keep, keep it on you here just a minute, because I think this kind of plays into it a little bit, what we've been talking about. What about the church, um, this came through on the text line, what about the church that for generations has, has been in one area, people lived and worked, and maybe it once was a parish ministry and now we see that in our context here sometimes in a suburban area. It's not urban, but it's, it's suburban. We're used to driving places. Uh, we, we don't always have the small uh, town feel or small community feel. But what happens to a church? Well, we can see what happens. A church, some people move away. Some people get tired of being a commuter church. Maybe there's options closer to home. And pretty soon that, that once vibrant parish church ministry is now scratching their head going, What's going to happen in 20 years? How are we going to be a community church again when everyone who is part of the church has moved away? Yeah. How does it reach, and maybe there's a demographic shift in there. How yeah. does, how does a, a church reach another? What does the church have to do to, to get there? Well, I think you're on a roll with the punches, so to speak. You've got to be able to change, um, and change is very hard. Churches have cultures um, that, as a result of the composition, of its members, of her members. So it's very difficult to make those kind of changes. Now all those people are gone and you have a new population that have come, probably a very different population than one was there 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So can you make that change? I think we ought to try to make that change, but I think most churches don't make it, mm -hmm. in my experience. Mm -hmm. They're not able to make the shift. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's a challenge that we've seen in our area here. Uh, the, the reform community has been a bit transitory, so as it moves and as it grows, but it changes, but then slowly over time, um, you do see um, 
yeah, churches continue to thrive. It just might look and feel a little differently than it ever used to, right? Um, Dr. Compton, this one for you. Um, someone here on the text line says they try to stray, stay away from using the word story uh, in referring to Scripture because in describing any biblical narrative because it might seem as though we're equating it with fiction, right? The use of story, story time, you often think of that as being fictional um, is what the asker says. So uh, it could be taken as fiction. How would, in your opinion, is this a legitimate concern? Yeah, that's it's a yes or no question. How about, yeah. in, 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 is this is that a legitimate concern, and how would you address it? Sure, I was, gonna, I was not just going to say yes or no, so <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry. I, yeah, no, I, I understand where it's coming from, and I've, I've grappled with that a lot. You know, what is the value of using the word story? Mm-hmm. What is the value of insisting on the word history? I, I actually had a, a, a friend who, who made the suggestion, um, instead of even talking about the, the story of Joseph or the story of Abraham, then the account Mm. of Abraham, the account of Jesus doing this, that, and the other thing. I, there's some merits to that. Part of it, though, is, is just what, what conversation are you having? Um, the word story increasingly doesn't just mean something made up, something spun. And, and so I think a lot comes down to what, who are you talking with? How are they using the word story? Because when they talk about their story, uh, whether it's their life or, or whatnot, um, they're talking about something real and concrete and tangible that happens, so they're not as quickly thrown off by hearing the story of, you know, the Israelites coming out of, uh, of Egypt. So that's just something to keep in mind. Some mm-hmm. people are going to hear the word story and maybe jump toward fictionality or, or untruth or made up. You can respond to that and you can, you can pivot even in your language, whereas other people aren't. And one of the values then of story as opposed to even history Again, this is unfair because history is fascinating. Uh, there's plenty Certainly of really, is. yeah. I mean, I, can you believe? I, I thought Dr. would Trey say would I was like just trying to get in good with my my, my <laughs> boss here. The um, history is um, for some people though. They, oh, that's class. You know, it can it can lead to its own um, negative byproducts. So again, being nimble with language, I think, is valuable. Yeah, and on that note too, with the stories, what what's the in your mind? What's one of the more predominant stories the world is telling us right now and what would be a great biblical counter to that story what's the message is it is it individualistic uh, thoughts is it consumerism is it what is it what would you say uh, it is an interest i mean the, the the things i cited you know taking that from joshua uh chatra i again i don't know how to quite pronounce his name if anybody knows offhand correct me later but i think he's on to something and, and it makes a lot of sense that you you are finding, well, I, I should say, it used to be, increasingly, it was sort of the, the, the secular naturalistic story that was, that was driving everything. You know, mm-hmm. it's this naturalistic impulse. And uh, increasingly, this now spiritual component has come in. More and more people, I'm, I'm, I'm spiritual. I'm, I'm reli- I believe in spirituality. I was amazed when I moved here um, to Northwest Indiana, which in some ways is still kind of on the fringe of the Bible Belt, there are so many psychics all over the place. There's like houses, crystal ball reading. I'm going, we're in Indiana? Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I get it in Los Angeles, but what's... So, but there is some, something of a pivot toward a, a belief in, I don't know if it's quite the transcendent, but these, these stories are sort of playing out and driving people one way or the other mm-hmm. all around us. I, I, really quick, before you jump in, I just noticed I have a comment here. They're saying, tell them to eat the mic, and I'm sure they're referring to the handhelds in your hand there. So maybe a little closer to our faces, just public, public service announcement for our panelists. Just to jump on the same question, um, I think uh, part of that story being told now is the idea that you will find freedom in following your heart. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a massive story that's in our world right now. You find freedom internally seeking your identity inside, following your own desires, that is freedom. And of course, that's the devil's lie since Eden. Uh, but that's certainly one of the stories out there that we have to counter with the gospel of Christ. Yeah, and I think, um, boy, that message is hitting our young people in our churches right in the face. Go ahead. Yeah, what, 
what Carl Truman speaks of as expressive individualism, going back to Rousseau and going forward, sort of tracing out that lineage. And Rosaria Butterfield, uh, so where's my, where my publish, my crossway? There's also my book on the crossway table, but I'm giving you some other books. There's Carl, Tr there's Carl Truman's books <laughs> uh, uh, and Rosaria Butterfield's Five Lies We Tell Ourselves. So, and they deal with a lot of this. Mm -hmm. And I, it uh, dawned on me when Moana came out. I went, oh, here's a Disney movie. Oh, wait, what makes Moana so great is that she throws off the shackles of life on the island. And that's every Disney movie, brother. Yeah, that's... <laughs> yes. E e even I know that, who, who abominate them all. But. Mo Moana was a stretch for me. I can handle, you know, mermaids and that sort of thing. But the ocean talking to you was a bridge too far. It just was ridiculous. But anyway, um, we have a number of young people in the audience today. And, um, you know, uh, Pastor Greg, I think you mentioned in yours um, something of an ecclesiology with other... I'll put it this way playing nice in the sandbox with other Christians whose doctrine might be slightly different, but nonetheless are faithful. Um, it could be the case for a lot of our young people. They've got Christian friends who don't all attend the same kind of churches uh, or maybe who have started to not attend church at all. How do we, though, when talking with younger people or anybody in our churches that maybe feel better ministered into a church outside of our own traditions, how do we, how do we navigate that? How do we be, how do we play nice in the sandbox, but yet still hold on to good convictions for good reason? Can we write this down? So I wanted to come back to something. Good. Play nice, but keep convictions. That's what I'm writing. I want to come back to the youth question. Just hit a few things because I got hit right away and I can't think right away. I have to take time. A few things that we see in our young people that's really exciting. Uh, they take time once a month simply for a prayer night. And we get a good number of youth coming out and they pray for about an hour and a half, hour, that's just straight prayer in groups. Um, really exciting to see our, our youth leaders cultivating a spirit of prayer. The Bible studies are done seriously. Uh, they, they try and have different uh, young men especially lead, but young women can take times as well. Really pushing the youth to take leadership. They combine ministry with service. The young people have to be active in service in different ways in the church. We have mentorship programs where young people may have an older member of the church who's their mentor. They meet with once a month, the non-family to sit with over coffee, ask how they're doing, pray with them, get to know them a little bit. Uh, our youth sing. Um, it is amazing how often we have people come in and say, I can't, and it's not just the youth. We, we uh, well, one great story. We had a guy come into church and he was blown away because he saw a family with eight kids and the mom walking behind them was pregnant. And she just said, wow, you guys do family. And he was really excited. But when, when people come to church, they see our young people, and our young people aren't on their phones generally. There might be a few in the back corner that still haven't managed to hit yet. Oh, I'm just kidding. I don't hit our young people. Um, but the rest, if they're sitting in a row, they're, they're listening to the sermons, they're, they're singing, they're worshiping, they're, they're, they're singing with their hearts. That's, that's a beautiful thing. And part of that is um, what J.C. Ryle called accessible, Christ-centered preaching. Um, when Ryle began, he was Oxford trained. He was preaching in churches in a rural country settings and people could not understand him. He had great rhetoric, he had great logic. They could not grasp his message. He has a famous line where he said, I realize I must sacrifice my style and become plain J.C. Ryle. Hmm. He realized it's most important for people to hear. And so having that preaching that you're aiming, um, they always taught us at Mid-America, to aim for the grade eight range, grade eight to nine in your preaching, and, and keep that gospel accessible to those who are there. Use illustrations. Christ used things from, from everyday life that people could grasp and lay hold of, and that helps people understand the message, both young and old. Then in terms of uh, playing nice with others and, and keeping, uh, so we have a bit of a fun, because we get the, sometimes we get the Baptists come to us. So that's kind of fun. Um, I always enjoy that. Uh, but how do you play nice and keep uh, consistency? How do you make sure that you're not teaching our youth that we are the only church? Uh, and yet, the distinctions are important. Um, this is best captured by reminding our entire church the goal of God is not our salvation, but his glory. The goal is not our salvation, but God's glory. 
And because the goal is God's glory, everything in God's word matters. Everything. So we can draw a line and say, we have brothers and sisters in Christ, they are saved. We have a shared faith in Christ. We are one with them in Jesus. But that's not the goal. The goal is the glory of God. So every part of his word matters. Our distinctives matter, our beliefs matter, uh, what the Bible teaches about baptism, about communion of the saints, that matters because it's not about us. The youth don't want a message that it's about them and they don't need watered down stuff. They need to be called to Christ and to realize God calls them to sacrifice all for the glory of his name. And, and oftentimes when we begin to set that kind of rubric, then when they do have those relationships, people from outside the church, they're actually iron sharpening iron because they're saying it's not about whether we're just both saved. You believe this, I believe this. Well, let's talk about that because God's glory matters. Let's discuss this. Sure. And that's really exciting to see. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And then you, you mentioned watered down preaching. And a few questions have come in, actually, Dr. Compton, regarding the story narrative that you spoke of, the story that you, um, approach that you spoke of in evangelism. How do you tell stories in a sermon? How do you use a narrative without it becoming complete fluff or all story and never get to the heart of the matter? Yeah, there, no. There's been quite a few questions from pastors, I think, on that. Well, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of us have been having some real fruitful conversations, even over coffee, the last couple hours, because I think there's that, enough of us still have that memory of that really lame version of preaching that's just getting up and, and telling stories and telling jokes and that kind of thing. And it doesn't lay a glove on Scripture. And, and I think that's the key, is that our, our, our job in the, in the pulpit is to open God's word, to, to tell that story, right? To tell that history, if we wanna go back to that, that language, right? But um, it, clearly we've seen people who are just way more interested in, in just entertaining people and getting them to kind of play out ideas than knowing our Lord from scripture. Uh, and, and that's the key, there's, there's a way to use a mode, use a narrative mode to unpack this passage uh, that, that uses all that is effective and all that's beneficial about storytelling that still keeps us grounded and following the, the topography of the text itself. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a really important thing. If we, if we introduce the use of story, whether it's to, as an introduction, whether it's to grab attention, whether it's to illustrate, to underscore something, you know, whether uh, our, our illustration of a point, maybe we don't read three or four pages of Lewis like we did this morning, but, but we're tapping into something. Um, all of that is, uh, there's tools for doing that then that, um, or those are tools for getting back at the text. And, and I think that's really what, what we need to be doing with that. If somebody is going, oh, I always knew I didn't really want to exegete scripture. I always knew I just wanted to talk about these fun things. Find a different career, um, but uh, but, th but that's not really what we're after when it comes to using this mode of communication to teach this message. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. And I think at this point I'm going to pivot just a little bit to you, Doctor Strange. And this is going to be one of those little I roll the thing in there, and it sort of disrupts the flow a little bit. But I think it's important because this is an issue that um, we're facing in our country, in our nation, um, maybe both of our nations but certainly in the States. Um, and I, I don't know exactly this question from the, from the text line, if it's sympathetic or not to Christian nationalism. So I'm just gonna leave it out there like this. And you hinted at it at your, in your address for sure. If the gospel is being preached, missions, missionaries sent out, and the spiritual role of the church is supported by the state, what are the risks of a Christian nationalist position to missions and evangelism? Yeah, I'm not completely sure. What was that third element? Say that again, if, if you would. The, and the spiritual role of the church. So it seems to be acknowledging that the church does have a spiritual role. Right. Uh, but if it's supported by the state. I'm not sure what that means, supported by the state. Maybe so, would, would endorsed by the state. Yeah, I, well, but I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm just, that could mean many things. Um, Maybe the question is really, I'm a faithful Christian. I'm right. an Orthodox Christian. Right. But I also am sympathetic to Christian nationalism. What's the real yeah, um, risk of that? 
Well, it depends on many, many things. And of course, it depends on how you define Christian nationalism. Um, and I think the basic problem, uh, there, there are several groups that call themselves Christian nationalists. That, well, let me just say this. The mainstream press would call us who are Christians and believe the Bible and our creeds and confessions and have at any point anything to do with politics or national affairs, which most Christians are rightly have interest in these things. Many of them would call us Christian nationalists. Um, so that's not really the proper, that's not the way I have been using it in discussions that I've had. I'm thinking about people who self-identify in that way. And, but even, it's just, this is the very changing field. I mean, even in, even in the last two months, um, Senator Josh Hawley has self-identified as a Christian nationalist. And in the speech in which he did that, did not name but cited the sort of work that Stephen Wolf is doing in the case for Christian nationalism and that Douglas Wilson is doing in Mere Christendom and differentiated himself from that and wanted to make it clear that whatever he was talking about was something that in terms of the church or the Christian religion had no aspect of coercion about it because part of the doctrine of the spirituality of the church rightly understood, which I've written a lot about, and I'm, I'm not, I can't, well, what does that mean? Well, there's, you can, there's a lot out there. But what, what it does mean is that the church is a spiritual institution, has a spiritual mission as an institution, which is to preach the gospel, to bring the gospel to all the nations, not with swords, loud clashing, rolls, stirring drums. In other words, it does it in a spiritual way, which is relying on the power of the Holy Spirit, never coercing or seeking to coerce people in any sense into the Christian faith. So it was interesting, Hawley makes this speech and says that. That's not to still say, I don't have some problems with what he said, because he said some other things that make it clear that he seems to think that the Bible, say maybe the Old Testament, has in it a fairly detailed blueprint. And most who are self-identifying as Christian nationalists certainly say Douglas Wilson. Stephen Wolf takes more of a two kingdom kind of approach of an older sort. So they don't all take the same sorts of approach here. But there's the, there's the conviction, say, on Douglas Wilson's part to take him. He takes a basic theonomic Christian reconstructionist approach he, he, that's how he identifies it. But he, and, and there's a lot of differences among those groups. But he says that the Bible contains a divine detailed blueprint for civil society. That's how he's defining his Christendom project. That's how many are defining Christian nationalism. So what I would say is the purpose of the Bible, the story of the Bible is in the main a redemptive story. Now the Bible has ethics in it, of course. It has all sorts of things in it. Whatever the Bible touches on, wherever it touches on it, it's true. But we, we commonly say, you know, the Bible is not a science textbook. It's not intending to give us the details of the theoretical disciplines, and you can go through the sciences. And similarly, it's not giving us this for civil society. It's not giving us a detailed blueprint for civil society. Certainly, it's not doing that for all the nations as the gospel goes global. Um, there are principles for nations. There are things about the civil magistrate that are there, but they're far more limited, I would argue, in principial. And one of the things I've just, uh, this is something I've particularly been hit by lately. I work a great deal in church polity. And in church polity, you come to recognize, and there were debates in the 19th century that talked about some of this, say, between Hodge and Thornwell, what does the Bible contain in terms of church polity? Well, it contains the principles of biblical Presbyterianism or biblical reform polity. It doesn't contain the details. Our church orders contain the details and our church orders aren't in the Bible as the church orders. We tease this out from the principles. Well, if the Bible doesn't contain a detailed blueprint for our church order in, down to the levels that we do in our, you know, for every detail, spelled out. How, is, how does it contain that for the state? 
And it, 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 you know, Israel, you can't just make the, I mean, we talk about general equity and that's a, that's a whole discussion and there's something proper there. But the fact of the matter is, is you could, I would say you can talk about nationalism. You can talk about borders. You could talk about immigration policy. All that stuff is legitimate. But when you add the adjective Christian to all these things, you're assuming that there is a Christian position on all these things. And there isn't. There isn't a Christian position. You say, well, we're supposed to love the strangers. We, 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 see, we talked, about, we talked about that. That doesn't mean a nation can't have a policy that, that talks about immigration. Now, Christians as Christians may want to influence that policy in some one direction or another. But the church can't come forth on Sunday morning and says, thus saith the Lord, this is the immigration policy. It can if the state is like killing immigrants. It can, you know what I mean? If, if they're clearly violating the Bible, but if a state makes a policy of this is how we want to be organized and so forth, okay, it can make such a policy. It can, it, can, it can do what it wants to with its borders as long as it's not violating any clear biblical principles. And uh, so the matter, the, the fact is, you know, it, it, <laughs> this is the problem when we say we, we, we need to think Christianly about everything. Our faith impacts everything. There's no area that we don't, we shouldn't think Christianly about. Yeah, sorry. There's no area that we shouldn't think Christianly about. But that doesn't mean there's a distinct, thus saith the Lord, Christian position about the details of everything. So I would say that's the main problem with Christian nationalism is it seems to think that the Bible has this plan uh, uh, that's detailed and it's simply not. And it's, it's really, if I may be blunt, it's a bully tactic to say, this is what the Bible says. We really where Doug Wilson, for example, says the Bible teaches theocratic libertarianism. And he says, that's what should be part of the new Christendom and the new establishment. Well, the old Christendom and the old establishment, the Puritans, for example, in old England and new England, they didn't think that the Bible taught libertarianism. They didn't think anything of the sort. So, and, and how does he justify this new approach? He says, well, this is more palatable. What? <sighs> Give me a break. <laughs> well, I, I, I did, admittedly, I did think that was going to be a little bit of a hiccup in the storyline that we've got going. But I will say, I think it's you important. You had to sell off. Yes, yeah, so I mean, it is important I've only just begun, to quote Karen no, Carpenter. No, I think, I think you've, you've begun well. Um, thank you, Dr. Strange. I just think that it is, you know, like you say, there's that there's the idea that well if you're if you're orthodox if you're even remotely a conservative christian if we can take that term well you must be a christian nationalism i think that as we look at to minister to our neighbors and look at ministering to the communities around our churches i think being aware that that could be a bias against us that we've not done anything to advocate ourselves is important as we get into that conversation i, I think it definitely is i think that um and, and the, the world likes to do that. The world likes to put these labels on us and lump us together in a certain way. And, and um, yeah, they, they look for that sort of thing, I think, as a way of rejecting out of hand what we do and believe. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly we would, we would all agree that Christ built his church by his spirit, his word. We've heard a lot of that today. But he also gives us hands and feet. So a question from one of the audience members is, sometimes we talk about evangelism efforts, like prayer walks, hospitality, street preaching, tracks, et cetera, and say that some might be better, more effective than others. Is there a place to speak of more effective ways of doing evangelism without sounding Arminian or like it's all about how we package the gospel or how we say it? I would, I would appeal to, to Paul and, and, and Greg on that one. Um, well, I, I think all our um, efforts, to use your word, or methods um, should be uh, subject to evaluation in light of scripture. Mm. Um, and also, um, something may be perfectly legitimate, but may not be fruitful, and therefore may not be prudent, right? So the evaluation is not just whether it's faithful to the Bible, theologically, for example, but whether or not it's actually uh, a, 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 a 
prudent practice to, to follow. Uh, I, if I could give you an example of what I'm talking about. So we prob we've done a lot of work on the streets, um, a lot, uh, over the course of 20 years. Probably, no exaggeration here, maybe 200, 250,000 pieces of literature, right? Wow. Um, of all various sorts, right? How many people walked into the church? I can count them on two hands. Yeah. Now, you got, on one hand, one man sows, another waters, God right. has to give the growth, yes. right? That's fine. You could say, well, that's seed sowing. My prayer is, I hope I get the glory, and somebody somewhere got something, somebody else talked to them about it, and they wound up, they just didn't come to our church, right? Mm -hmm. That may be. But for us, though we're not a business, where we're not concerned about the bottom line, you do have to think about man hours and money mm -hmm. for all of that. Um, untold man hours, untold printing, purchasing, etc. Is that the best stewardship with respect to that kind of evangelism? So we've kind of scaled back on that and have thought differently about evangelism in, in light of that. Mm -hmm. So we're still open to a variety of things, but we are attempting to be more organic in our evangelism. That would take us down another path, but mm -hmm. Greg. I think I'd just build on um, what Paul's saying, um, if I may, uh, even be so bold as to say there's times for different efforts in evangelism that come and go. And there's an element of the Spirit's leading, not in an abstract, external way, the Lord told me to come here, but a time where the church is praying about something and saying, maybe it's time to stop that outreach and start a new one. And it's, it's like, when do you close a church for a church plant? Oh, it calls for a lot of wisdom and prayer. But that kind of thing happens. And you might have done street evangelism for five years and say, no, we're gonna try something different now. That's okay. I love, I don't know who was, was it Dr. Kim who said, it's okay to fail? I love that line. Don't be afraid to fail. And, and sometimes our efforts, we say this isn't working anymore. We stopped our VBS program. We used to be out in the country. No one ever came to our church for VBS who wasn't a church member. We began something called Day in the Park. We go into three city parks. One Saturday each, we run a carnival, we share the gospel, we give them food, we give them tracks. We reach in one of those days around 100 non-Christians, 80 non-Christians in one shot. Never come to church, maybe zero, doing it for 10 years, eight years, uh, but love it, great opportunity. Uh, these things are really tough to tell. One thing to be aware of for evangelism efforts is that there is no perfect evangelism effort. Who are you? How has God made you? What desires and gifts has he given you? If I could borrow a story that I heard at a Strathroy URC where Pastor Zechfeld goes, the story may have grown in its telling, so you may not even recognize it anymore, Pastor Zechfeld. But I heard that Strathroy had a ladies' circle that was knitting and doing quilting together during the week or maybe once a month or something like that. And these ladies became convicted that they should share the gospel more with others. And so they said, well, what can we do? Well, we're already getting together and doing this. Let's just advertise and invite others to come and join us. And so they opened up their knitting circle to the community. And they started getting people coming in from the community to join them and knit and do quilting. And then, if, as the legend goes, the ladies said, well, if these people are coming to us, we should be telling them something about Jesus. So they began devotions at these times, so they had a chance to share the gospel. What do you enjoy doing? Andrew is third base coach. <laughs> so do you like sports? Are you coaching your kids' teams anyway? Invite your teams over to your house for a coach's night, a party. And you don't need to share the gospel when you're working as a local coach on the side of the field, but maybe you can have the team over for a team night and tell them you're a Christian and say we would love getting to know your kids. We do this because we love others, because we love the Lord who loves us. But who are you, where is your gifting, and where are you already connecting with community, Can combine it with who God has made you to be, what you enjoy, and use it for the gospel? Yeah. I, I, I agree with everything Greg said. I think there is um, intrinsic value in having people go out and encounter non-Christians and do evangelism for their benefit, not necessarily for the people they're contacting benefit. It's good.
good to have people out articulate what they believe, encounter unbelief, objections, responses. There's, there's value in that, even if nobody winds up coming to church. Mm -hmm. So all of those things are subject to evaluation, but that's a, that's a very beneficial thing for a Christian to do that every Christian should do for their own spiritual well-being and health. I don't think that can be said enough, what Reverend Murphy, what both of these men just said, but that last thing, I've seen churches go out, do this, that, or the other, and conclude this doesn't work, and they do nothing. You're not going to have all the answers. I, I know in our church uh, in Glassboro, New Jersey, which grew markedly steadily during the 90s, we did a number of things and we did, we just, we had continual sorts of outreach going on. So we had people going out and we found that the Lord did very little through that direct outreach, but because the people had the spirit, he built us up anyway through his own means and methods and, and, and the people came in. So I think if you just say, well, we're shutting down the evangelistic program because it gets nowhere. Well, probably you'll, there won't, you won't have a lot of growth necessarily. But I think when, you, when you're obedient to what you know to do, what seems reasonable and to, to reach out, the Lord, will, the Lord can bless. Yeah. Bring I, in. I think it was D.L. Moody who said, I, I, uh, I like what I'm doing better than what you're not doing. Yeah. <laughs> You can know, even throw this in. Something you mentioned a few minutes ago, Greg, is, is being so focused on God's glory. Like that really has to sit at, at the center of this. And I think that triangulates with what you're saying. Yeah. God is glorified when his people make his name famous. When his people are excited to placard the, the greatness of our God and his work. And, and of course, we, we use our resources well, no doubt. No, that's just not even what we're talking about here. Um, but it is the, the fact that by going out and by sharing and by talking, God is glorified. And that's at the heart of his mission, is the spreading of his glory throughout the ends of the earth. Just a note for Mike and for Andrew, if you're going to invite your little league team over to your house at the end of the season, make sure you're a decent coach. <laughs> Andrew was a great coach. He would talk about the philosophy of teamwork all the time, and I would go, yeah, but we are going to win, right? <laughs> I gave many lectures to those kids. They, they didn't follow, but they listened to Mike. Yeah, no, it was, it was a great, great time we had. Um, as we wrap up the panel, um, um, we're talking about things that all sorts of people in the church can do, but there is a special um, process that someone would undergo to be a pastor. Right? And then we're a seminary, of course. To those who may be in the audience thinking, I could be called to ministry, I don't know what that quite looks like, what next steps would you say to someone sitting here who maybe is, um, well, we have a lot of high school youth, right? We have, like, what would some good steps be? And then also maybe take that to the church leadership and say, what are some things you can look for in young men in your congregation to help identify that next generation of leaders? Is that too big? Is that too... Was that not clear? Like, is that, I think we can navigate through some of that, right? No, I think there are things, I, I think in a regular way, it's good for the office bearers to have, to be praying together, for them to be praying together, to have their eyes open and to ask the Lord to sensitize them uh, to, we're going to hear about the general office of believer. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm, that's the way I'm putting it. Paul will put it in his own way. Uh, that's a Presbyterian way of speaking about it, but um, uh, but but you know the use of of everybody in the church, but particularly an eye of young men for special office and the office of minister. I, I will just let me say this about about that. I think we I think in some of our circles um, we have been in danger historically, and I say this as one very very appreciative of Abram Kuyper and seeing myself as a pupil of his work and writings. Um, I think we've, we've gotten the message that in every area, every endeavor, every part of life, every profession, every career, rightly so serves him. But we've, we've sometimes equalized it so much that you don't need to be a minister. You can be a, you can be a, a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer. Yes, but we need ministers. Mm -hmm. And we need to challenge young men to be ministers. 
We need to be challenged them to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. So I, I think some of the criticism of Kuiper is that he emphasized the church's organism at times over against the, the, at the expense of the church's institute. And I think there, I think there is some merit in that, that criticism because you, it, it, it can create a culture that really downplays the church and the ministry of the church, and you don't want to downplay that. Um, you, you want to say you can serve the Lord in, in every way as a Christian, but you also want to say there is a distinct call to preach the gospel, and we want, we want to keep that before the church. Mm -hmm. We want to keep that before the young men of the church. So I think it's good, for the, particularly for the pastors and elders, to have that in mind, but for all the office bearers to be thinking about how can we bring young people, but young men especially, you know, they can be deacons helping hands. They can start there. We can have them as assistant in this Christian education or Sunday school class. I think you need to be intentional in that way. You need to be thinking and, 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 and inviting and recognizing that, you know, you keep your wits about you. You'll have a parent come all excited. The eight-year-old kid says, I want to be a pastor, and they've got, well, an eight-year-old kid says lots of things. And you don't say, well, we're putting him on a pastoral track. You, but you, that doesn't mean that you don't pray for him. You don't look, because people say that, and then they're on to something else. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you, you keep your eyes open. And we have programs in our churches. I know in the, in the OPC, we have something in our Christian Ed Committee that serves the whole denomination called the Timothy program, and the Timothy conference, and it starts in high school, and it goes on to college, and it's specific, and you take people in, you bring them into seminaries, and you bring them into local area churches, and show them what it's like. Um, so there's lots of things I think that we can do to encourage this, and should be on the lookout for. That's right. Well, if I could speak to the, to the young person, the, the young man who's, who's considering, I, am I called to ministry, do I want to be a pastor? Start by talking with a pastor and finding out what it means to be one. And I say this, I had a, a friend in college who once said, um, I, I, sometimes I think I want to be uh, an admiral in the Navy. I want to stand on the bridge of a carrier. Other times I think I want to, to direct a famous symphony orchestra and control every aspect of the music from the podium. Are you talking to me? <laughs> and other times he says, I, I think I want to be a pastor standing in that pulpit. And, and I was saying, you know, whatever you choose, don't choose the last one. <laughs> I, but, but I say that because he had a conception of what the pastorate was, what the ministry was. And I would, I would encourage people, talk with your pastor and learn about the ministry. It's, it's multifaceted. It's sad that sometimes uh, the, the response that pastors will give is, oh, good, I'm going to show you what a miserable calling it is so that you, you stay away from it. Oh, brothers, don't do that. Share, share with them what a delight it can be too. Share them the whole thing, but, the, but, uh, but encourage you to learn what the pastorate is, learn what the ministry is mm -hmm. as you're testing that call. If, if I could, I would add, um, Proverbs talks about a multitude of counselors, their safety. And I think it's important as you're discerning an inward call to the ministry that you subject yourself to a multitude of counselors. Mm -hmm. There's the story about the young man in the cornfield in the Midwest who saw the plane going across the sky, and it was a sky rider. And as the plane went across the sky, he left the letters PC. And he ran into his father. He said, I've been called to the ministry. I've been called to the ministry. The father says, well, why do you say that? He said, I saw PC in the sky. Preach Christ. The father said, you fool. It means plant corn. <laughs> <laughs> Saw a multitude of counselors as you good, good yes. practice. Yeah. Yeah. Just an encouragement to oftentimes when people wrestle with the call to ministry, they may also be wrestling, and this happens uh, uh, for men and women. They may just be wrestling with a realization you need to live more for God. God may be putting things on your heart that you need to live more for Christ and obey the Lord. Get serving wherever you are, get in His Word more, study the Scriptures more. If, if we have a young man come to us in our church saying they're interested in ministry, we just say, what are you doing? What have you been doing in serving the Lord lately? Mm -hmm. How is your Bible study going? So just get close to the Lord, serve him, be faithful, trust him to lead you where he will have you go, and he will as you, uh, as you pursue him. Okay, very quickly as we close. You can pick one or two titles, best resources, we're not going to solve all the world's problems in this panel, obviously. I think we got off to a good start. 
with our conference today as well. What are some great resources, titles that pastors could consult in areas of evangelism uh, and that lay people could also, in, in written, published works? Um, what's your reading list for this? T Tell the Truth by Will Metzger um, is great. Um, previously mentioned, uh, Evangelism, Sovereignty of God, R.B. Kuyper has a similarly titled book. They tend to be a little bit more theological uh, and not as practical. Will mm -hmm. Metzger's book combines both. I think also John Leonard wrote a good book recently called Get Real, which is very helpful in terms of uh, contemporary evangelical or evangelistic, I should say, efforts, practices, and stuff. So. Very good. Any other suggestions? Well, I mentioned some, I, I, you know, just in terms of understanding the culture and where we are. I know a, a lot of people, I think what Truman is helpful about is to show you that uh, I, I've, I've encountered a lot of people in churches who say, what is going on? And one of the answers I give is what's been going on in the university for decades. It's just, I mean, people talk about, you know, various sorts of critical theories, uh, various sorts of movements, uh, this r sort of re-upping of, of Marxism again, which never goes away. Um, this has been in the academy for decades, and, but the academy has, in, in the last five years, especially Industry. spilled into the popular culture. Yeah. So, so some of the, like Butterfield, you know, Truman, they have some good stuff that helps expose. She was in the academy, and, you know, mm -hmm. Truman is. For Missions, Let the Nations Be Glad by John Piper is a great book. Um, for Apologetics, uh, Tactics by Gregory Kukul is a good book, especially for young people. And, and several of you have asked, and I mentioned it again, Christine Dillon. I mean, I, you asked about storytelling, telling the gospel through story. I mean, there's things you're going to disagree with her on. She's not confessionally reformed by any stretch. Uh, but again, just sharpening a set of tools that I don't know we've often utilized as well as we might in, in confessional reform circles. So I found it very beneficial. Excellent. Well, brothers, thank you uh, for your, being with us at the conference this weekend and also for spending some time on stage uh, together uh, to talk about some of the things that are on the, uh, the minds of our audience here. And so uh, thank you very much.